Good morning, everybody. This is Chris Hislop, the Executive Director at the Montana World Affairs Council. Welcome to another episode of Connect Montana, where we bring Montana to the world and the world to Montana. It's Peace Week here at Connect Montana, and we're very happy to have our friends from the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center here in Missoula joining us. Today, we've got a very special guest. Jan Eglund is the Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Council. From 2015 to 2018, he was special advisor to the UN mediation efforts in Syria and chaired the 23 Nation Humanitarian Task Force for the protection of and access to Syrian civilians. Eglin served as UN Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator during 2003 to 2006, where he spearheaded reform of the global humanitarian system. From 1990 to 97, he was State Secretary in the Norwegian Foreign Ministry, excuse me, Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where he co-organized the Norwegian Channel that led to the Oslo Agreement between Israel and the PLO in 1993, as well as peace agreements in Guatemala in 96 and elsewhere. He has numerous other senior posts in humanitarian, human rights, and peacemaking organizations. In 2006, Time Magazine named Eglund as one of the 100 people who shape our world. And his memoir, A Billion Lives, was published by Simon & Schuster in 2008. Jan, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming, and over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, good to be online with Montana from Norway. Uh, Norway is the Montana of Europe, as you may know. Uh, a, uh, a country which is big uh, in nature and big in extension with... Um, a, a limited population, five million people, but uh, with great ambitions, which I also believe Montana has. Now, uh, let me spend uh, the next 10, uh, 12, uh, 14 minutes on some general lessons learned from the peace processes that I have been involved in. Uh, I have indeed, on behalf of the United Nations, on behalf of my country, Norway, on behalf of Nor uh, Norwegian non-governmental organizations, international non-governmental organizations, been involved in a dozen peace processes, including the, the Oslo Accord between Israel and PLO, 1993, that you will remember. I've been involved in the peacemaking in uh, Guatemala that led to peace uh, agreements uh, there, uh, first the ceasefire and then the comprehensive peace agreement. Norway was leading the effort by a group of friends. Uh, I've been involved in Colombia where I was the special envoy and my country Norway helped facilitate after I left this uh, file um, uh, the, the peace agreements between the FARC guerrilla and the government. So uh, as well in Sudan, Sri Lanka and the Balkans and elsewhere. Now what, what are the main lessons I learned? Well the number one is really the parties need to be willing and able to make a, an agreement for peace to have a chance really. And there is a difference between the small state, Norway, and the superpower, the US, in that respect. Uh, Norway very clearly can not make unwilling parties willing against, their, uh, against what, what is their desire, really. We cannot force anyone to do anything that they do not want. What we can do is we make, can make parties able, that parties that are willing and unable, we can make them able to talk. Uh, like, for example, Norway, in my time as Deputy Foreign Minister, helped the communist guerrilla of Guatemala to have a, a professional peace mediate, uh, peace negotiators that could then participate in the mediation offered by the United Nations and facilitated by us, the group of friends. The US can actually make unwilling parties willing uh, in the sense that you can, you, can, you, you can exert a very high price on their unwillingness. 
you you can force them in a way to the negotiate the table because the US is a superpower. The cost of this is, of course, that the US, as opposed to Norway, is normally seen as partisan, not so often seen as a, as a neutral uh, intermediary that do not have other interests than altruistic interests that little Norway may be seen to have, as well as the United Nations. So, so let me, uh, in a way, then uh, just now list five concrete lessons learned from my 30, 40 years of, of, of experience with conflict resolution. And the first one is you have to decide what kind of a role you take as a third party wanting to uh, resolve a conflict. Many would say, well, shouldn't, it be, shouldn't the role be the mediator? Well, not necessarily. Uh, again, I said, the mediator needs to have leverage to be effective. The US, US can be a mediator because it either by force or by um, desire by parties, say the US is so strong, we, we, we need to accept they are the one that mediate, comes with a proposal, pushes us towards not only the negotiating table, but also to the agreement. Switzerland is more like the host. Say, here's Geneva, very nice place, very neutral, no risk coming here. You, you can all feel comfortable here, no surprises, but also no leverage. I think Norway, and, and to some extent, um, many uh, non-governmental entities, including many of the, 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 uh, the efforts of Harvard uh, negotiations, uh, 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 institute and so on has been that of the facilitator. So the facilitator is actively pu push, trying to encourage the parties not only to talk but also to reach um, uh, common grounds. That is the role that I've been mostly um, uh, uh, doing in my time as uh, in conflict resolution. Second uh, idea is we need to agree on what kind of a goal we have as a third party. Again, the impulse of most people would say, well, I thought the goal was full peace, an end to arms, um, a, a full reconciliation. Uh, the ultimate aim may very well be that, should be that. That's a, the moral imperative is, is to, to go, go for full peace. Very often that is not very realistic short term, maybe not even in, uh, intermediate, uh, in, in an intermediate perspective. In the Congo, in North Kivu, where I was, there are 140 identifiable armed groups. At one point in, in um, Syria, when I was doing that, uh, that, that, that work for the UN for humanitarian uh, negotiations, uh, access negotiations, uh, the political experts had listed 1,800 armed groups with a name. Many of them in umbrellas, many of them in, with some, uh, so, some co contact, but 1,800. So full peace, full reconciliation is the long-term goal. The short-term goal could be a prisoner exchange. It could be uh, the, uh, the access negotiations for refugees. It could be uh, a vaccination campaign so that, uh, that none, none becomes uh, sick from epidemic disease. And it could these days be coronavirus ceasefires because we need to avoid to have a lot of movement of people and refugees and whatnot. If we cause that, we may end up as soldiers getting the virus. Third, uh, third, third uh, lesson is if there is an agreement against all odds, 
it's going to be controversial. It's actually a very thankless task to try to make peace. Because if you make this agreement, it will have to be in the eyes of the parties, and especially the fighters on each side, or the many sides, a smelling controversial compromise. Uh, their, their, the goals they have set when they started the conflict were ultimate. The, 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 the agreement will not look good among the, the, the ideologues, the fighters. It's going to be controversial. Never ever seen a peace agreement that wasn't extremely controversial, like the Oslo Agreement turned out to be, both in Israel and on the PLO, uh, PLO side, it was a compromise. Fourth one <coughs> agreement uh, uh, lesson is these, I've never seen in recent times a peace, peace talks being between symmetric parties. It's not Germany and France anymore as was, or, or Norway and Sweden, or for that matter, Iran or Iraq. It's really between a guerrilla force and a government. Or it could be between Israel, supported by the US, the world's superpower, Israel itself having one of the largest militaries, most effective on earth, and on the Palestinian side, uh, you know, incoherent, uh, divided uh, Palestinian leadership and no military might. It's asymmetric. And therefore, the agreements will normally tend to be closer to the stronger party, which again adds to the controversy. Uh, <clears throat> maybe um, then uh, a, a final uh, a, a lesson, and then we could um, we we could have a, a, a dialogue. It is very difficult, to put it mildly, to get agreements in 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 a, in in, in a, a, an armed conflict. What's even more difficult is to implement to realize the agreements. So we often said, I mean, the, 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 how, how do you make agreement between often uh, several parties to a conflict with a lot of bitterness and often not even unity of command on, uh, on the various uh, sides? For them to agree on anything, very difficult. To implement it, even more difficult. Again, what we saw on the, with the, with the uh, Oslo agreement, it was an agreement, not a peace agreement, it was an agreement to negotiate peace. And of course the US took on the quest of realizing the Oslo Accord with Norway, with the U European Union, with Russia, everybody was there in front of the White House when we came with the text and it was signed with Clinton there as the matchmaker between Rabin and Arafat. We were not able to succeed. It turned out to be more difficult to realize the agreement of principles, as it was called, which was the schedule for negotiating peace uh, in, in a five-year period. Parties had agreed to disagree on a number of issues, and it turned out to be too difficult to, to implement it. Very often, what one is underestimating is the importance of of, of, of showing that there is a peace dividend, that immediately life becomes better. If people are as unemployed, as hungry, uh, and, 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 and uh, there is no um, improvement, many of the fighters would say, listen, I was better off as a strong man with a gun than I am now in a miserable demobilization camp with no, no job, no future, no, no nothing. You have to be able to implement it um, uh, also by showing that the general population and those who lay down the arms will have a better future. 
Uh, maybe I'll hand back to you now, uh, Chris, after these uh, introductory words and hear, hear if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Jan. I mean, a great introduction and, you know, uh, hard lessons learned from a lifetime of peacemaking, to be sure. Let's start with, uh, we've got a number of questions, Jan, and not a lot of time as usual, but let's start with um, my colleague, Betsy, at the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center. Over to you, Jean uh, Betsy. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, Jan. Uh, I'm just so impressed with your whole career of of work and um, uh, changing the world, shaping the world. So yeah. thank you, thank you for all that. Um, I'm I'm just curious about the last concept that you mentioned about implementing that, and in terms of the time frame and how what what is put in place for that? Because I know sometimes the inclusivity is difficult to make sure that all of the people that will participate in implementation are in agreement with it. And so how is, how is that structured um, going forward? Well, the, uh, the, usually there are clauses in the text uh, also for implementation. Everything from, you know, constitutional reform that could take a lot of time and would even include the, you know, the parliament, the uh, legislative assembly. It could take years. Uh, and I think everybody understands that, that will take, take time. What, what is ultra important, however, is that one has, in a way, a hundred day plan for good things to happen immediately, like um, the, the, the fighters who put down their arms get some kind of stipend so that they can feed themselves and their families. They are immediately put into vocational training to, be, to get civilian uh, work. Uh, some could be integrated in police or an army, uh, etc. The problem is usually that they are then assembled in some camps and there is nothing happening. For the, for the first six, seven, eight, nine months, they sit around and they drink and they remember the days where they felt powerful. So the, the implementation plan has to be there during the negotiations and then it has to be amply funded. There is often not either funding for it so that people do not see that there is more employment, more social benefits, etc., for everybody. Jan, um, I'll summarize a question from one of our participants. Your experience that, that you've laid out here, you know, it, it covers uh, um, you know, several decades. And so um, during the period, um, you know, it, we have the Cold War, we have a kind of unipolar world, then we have a multipolar world. Um, any comment on the kind of global um, political environment? Has it ever been any easier or more difficult, say, in the past 30 years, to make and keep peace? It's, uh, well, it's a great question, really. The, uh, <laughs> it was, um, now it's not, it's not easy. Uh, when the powers cooperate, it's much easier. So you could say, ac actually, <laughs> it was easier to make peace between Israel and the PLO in 1993, 94, 95, 96, when we failed, than it is today. The US and Russia, US and China, US and Europe, a lot of disagreement, a lot of inward looking. US is looking inwards now. Uh, US is, is being uh, polarized today. The US was much more of a coherent uh, actor supporting these efforts, so they say like Norway uh, had at the time. Um, the, uh, on top of that, uh, you have uh, the, the, the Shia power Iran and the Sunni power Saudi fighting each other to the last Syrian and to the last Yemenite, it seems. So you also have a lot of regional uh, rivalries that are even more bitter more well-funded than before. There is, in my view, more powers bringing fuel to the fire now than before. And you do, do not have 
a, a, a common effort of the Security Council powers, unfortunately. I'm a, I'm a little pessimistic at uh, the time being. I hope we will come back to a better, to, to better days of international cooperation. Jan, a question from me. Um, and you mentioned this in your book, A Billion Lives, but I just wanted, uh, I wanted to just check in with you on the following. Uh, uh, when we were together involved in um, the situation in northern Uganda, and, and Jan was working um, with the government of Uganda and a rebel group called the Lord's Resistance Army, led by a particularly um, heinous uh, person, but you said something very interesting at that time. You said, if you want to get people out of hell, you have to talk to the devil. Uh, and and that, that references a lot of things, not the least of which is oftentimes um, in the processes, you need to talk to people who are not legitimate heads of sovereign governments. They're rebel leaders. They're, they, they don't hold any power beyond their, their small group. And, and that can create a lot of controversy, particularly with the government who says, well, we shouldn't legitimize um, these groups by talking to them. So how does that stand? Again, it's it's uh, difficult. It's probably been more difficult because these days uh, governments tend to label everybody fighting against them as terrorists. And if you're on, on a terror risk, no one no no one can touch you. You you only have to 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 fight them. I mean, it, of course, when we started the. Oslo, um, the, the secret Norwegian channel, it was between Israel and the PLO. The PLO was a terrorist organization at the time. There was just as much as Hamas is today. The mutual recognition between the two, PLO had a stated objective of, of, of eliminating the state of Israel and the state of Israel and the US had the stated objective of destroying and fighting PLO as a terrorist organization. Uh, I, I, I'm glad my own country is very, uh, um, uh, very seldom labels international armed actors as terrorists, which means we can talk to them. Uh, it took the US to reverse policy and then suddenly Taliban was fine to negotiate with but it took a lot of time for that to, 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 to happen. Um, but it's also, uh, really, it's true. You, one should not legitimize political violence and honor political violence with, with talks, talks in the presidential palace on constitutional reform. It's a, it's a judgment call. Uh, th th there has to be a real political content in the struggle and it has to be public um, support uh, for it to merit being seen as a legitimate party to a conflict and in the end that's a judgment call. Jan I think we have time for one more question this comes from a participant um, in, in two parts do you see a coalition of countries being more effective when working with disputing countries and what are your thoughts on private, religious, et cetera, organizations assisting with negotiations? I mean, faith-based groups are, are, are very important uh, when they assist. Of course, faith-based groups very often are part of the polarization of what's happening. I mean, I'm, I've never seen the, the Israeli-Palestinian talks as polarized as now because of the three great religions basically are going in, 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 in opposing directions uh, uh, more than any bef uh, ever before. So the interreligious talks and cooperation is very, is very important. Um, a, a good model for, for talks is a group of friends with all of the, all of the um, influential actors around a table trying to harmonize and uh, give coherence to their efforts. Again, when I led the, the, the mediation or rather the, the, the talks on humanitarian access to besieged areas and so on in Syria, the US was at the table, Russia was at the table, Iran was at the table, Saudi Arabia, 
Turkey, they were all there and they mostly helped. And I would say most of them, most of them helped most of the time. Much, much better to have them around the table than outside making problems for you. But that you cannot have 10, 10 mediators. There has to be one mediation. Best, in my view, is if that is an effective UN mediation with the mandate from the Security Council. So that's, been, that's the, why the UN was set up. That's also why you have a Security Council. And let's hope we can return to those days. Jan, thank you so much for that. There are other questions, but I'm afraid we've run out of time. So I really appreciate you taking time all the way in your Norwegian cabin to speak with us today. Uh, we're, we're much obliged. Um, any last comments from you, Jan? No, I mean, my, my, my uh, last comment is, is, of course, that one in a hundred efforts uh, of, of conflict resolution succeeds. Uh, and still it's worth the effort. I mean, when you see how costly war is, bloodshed is, there, there was this horrific terrorist attack now in, uh, in Kabul. Norwegian Refugee Council is neighbors to the MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, and one of the hospitals was, uh, was attacked by armed men who killed babies and, 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 and newborns and their mothers. The conflict in, in, in Afghanistan has been going on for a generation now. The U.S. has spent hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars there. The, 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 there needs to be more investment in peace work because the cost of conflict is so horrendous. There is no military solutions to any of the, of, of the conflicts that I've been involved, involved in. And all are, however, possible to end by talks and mediation. Jan, thanks for ending on that optimistic note. Uh, I think we would all agree. So thank you again for joining us. Um, thank you to all the participants for coming. If you missed the um, other shows on Peace Week, we had Rania Dagash Kamara from the UN Peacekeeping Operations, the Blue Helmets, on yesterday. And we had author and peacemaker Harriet Martin on Monday. That's on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook. Next week, we've got another round of Connect Montana, where we're going to look at the international aspects of Missoula and talk to some native Missoulians. So please don't miss that. Thanks again for joining, everybody. Have a good weekend. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.